In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among them. Blessed are for thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now at the hour of our death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kind within us a fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit. Granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise and ever joyous in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady Guadalupe. St. Joseph. St. Ignatius. St. Faustina. All God's angels and saints. St. Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night he was handed over took bread after he had given thanks broke it and said this is my body that is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are ill and infirm, and a considerable number are dying. If we discerned ourselves, we would not be under judgment. But since we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Therefore, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that your meetings may not result in judgment. The other matters I shall set in order when I come. The word of the Lord. Good evening. Last week we gave a practical interpretation of number 158 in the diary of St. Faustina. And that interpretation was that she was transferred from one convent to another. And uh, she decided she had a free day. And she decided to use her free day by making a day of retreat. So that was the backdrop of my talk last week. And from that, I suggested that all of you at least consider the possibility of of making a monthly day of recollection. That might might seem somewhat um, challenging. As religious, we have in our rule uh, a monthly day of recollection and a a yearly eight-day retreat or Ignatian retreat. So as part of the religious rule to have a monthly day of retreat. Uh, however, I, I feel it wouldn't be a bad idea for some of you to think about at least the possibility of trying to do it. Um, and I gave you, if you remember, good half of my talk last week was on ways in which that could be done. Getting up maybe relatively early and making a holy hour and then going to mass and then saying your rosary and then going to McDonald's to get your second cup of coffee, and then making another holy hour, and then going to another mass, and then taking a little rest, getting your third holy hour in, getting your another rosary in, and then getting your fourth holy hour in sometime maybe in the evening. And in the course of that, try to make your monthly confession. Now, in the long run, if you do that, uh, your, your month is going to flow more smoothly.
So uh, if, you, if you try to do this until uh, the year 2020, the next seven months of the year, eight months of the year, uh, I think if you, if you do that and you come up to me at the end of this year, the beginning of next year, you're going to say, well, Father, I thought that in that talk you gave, I thought you were crazy, no? But I realize you're not crazy, no? He said, now I, I recognize you get that, that, that monthly day in the retreat and my, my month flows much more smoothly. You might accept the challenge. You might try to do it. No? So this means you have to anticipate a month beforehand to see when you have that, that free day. Uh, people that I direct, I suggest this. And um, I think it's a good idea to maybe do it. Maybe you can't, maybe the bar is too high, but at least maybe you can do a half day. And then maybe try to get a whole day in. Because if you give yourself to God in prayer, God is always going to bless you. And you'll find that during the course of the next month, Instead of you doing all the work yourself, you find out that God is doing the work more than you. And when he does the work more than you, it's done better, right? I think our problem is that we try to do a lot of our work without consulting God and asking God to help us out. Consequently, we flounder, flop, and fail. And um, we're frustrated because of that. Hmm? You might try to do it. Amen or oh me? So I'm seeing some of you within the next month or two, I'll probably, when I'll corner you and saying, did you make your day, day retreat? Don't say yes, I slept in, I took a long siesta and I <laughs> retreated from human existence, no. <laughs> we can manipulate language, right? Retreating from life, no? No. All right, uh, let me give you the reason why I read that biblical passage and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into the, the diary once again. You have several accounts of the institution of the Eucharist. You have it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You don't have it in John. What do you have in Paul? So there you have the institution of the Eucharist in Paul. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 you can find. If you were listening to me, you hear Paul recounting what you hear that, there at the Last Supper. However, what I read is a, it's a Eucharistic, it's a Eucharistic um, abuse. What happened was this. The early Christian church would kill two birds with one stone. In this sense, they would have, they would try to combine the social with the sacramental, which is good. We should do that. We should have some downtime when you spend some time with a friend or two. Nothing wrong with that. It's good to have friends, no? But I think you should have a good friend. The young people, work with the young people, they say a friend is someone who's faithful to you. Well, cholos can be faithful to each other, right? Know what a cholo is? They're usually pretty faithful, huh? Faithful in evil, no? But a friend of someone is not simply faithful to each other, but helps you to get closer to your best friend, Jesus Christ. You like that? That would be my definition. Uh, your friend, I think he's your friend, Aristotle, 
says that friendship is based on commonality of interests. That would be the Aristotelian definition. Commonality of interest, but that interest has to be interest has to be the person of Jesus Christ. Interest in Jesus and what Jesus is interested in. So they would come together for uh, agape. Agape is a Greek word which actually means love, like a love feast. More than once have I noticed that the Filipinos will sometimes call people agapito. <laughs> right, Fran? I see that quite often, no? Agapito, no? It's like the Beatles song, get a little, my lo- get a little bit of my love, huh? <laughs> ag- ag- agapito means a little love. <laughs> and um, so the... Uh, they would have a, a get together, and then afterward they would go from that to the celebration of the meal of the Lord. Uh, I don't think I don't think they had a Eucharistic fast back then because we didn't have any canon law, no. So they they could probably finish the meal, and then shortly after that they would just have the celebration of the meal of the Lord by Saint Paul, the priest and bishop. But there was a problem. John, you know what the problem was? I didn't think so, so I'll tell you. (laughs) Is that the the rich came and the poor came. And the the rich people, the only thing they could bring to the party was their poverty. That was about it. Well, they couldn't bring anything because if they're poor, they didn't have anything to bring. Whereas the rich people would bring their food and they'd bring their so they'd bring their wine. So there would be a there would be discrimination between the rich and the poor. So the poor would would go there and they would go hungry. Whereas the rich they go to town. They would eat and eat and eat and eat. And also they would... It is Miller time, no? I mean, they would drink and drink and drink. So it was like a, it, it was, it was a double or triple sin. Sin of gluttony. Gluttony, you don't eat too much. Sin of drunk and drunkenness, which is also sin of gluttony. And then the next sin would be uh, neglecting the poor. So if you have you have two bologna sandwiches, you want to give one to your friend. <laughs> I know you're gonna say, don't give me that bologna, father. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist that one, Eric. <laughs> That's a good one, huh? <laughs> so if you... <laughs> I'm going to follow up on that one. <laughs> if you eat both, you're full of bologna, right? <laughs> Really full of baloney, huh? Oh. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't been full of baloney, but half full of baloney. No. <laughs> so that was a that was a sin in in, uh, in neglecting the poor. So I think of them, then the fourth sin was this: is then after that they go to mass, after getting drunk eating too much, uh, just basically kind of despising the poor. And then they go in to receive Holy Communion. Not very good. So uh, of all the writings of St. Paul, this is one of the strongest. 
And if, you were, if you're kind of zoning out when I was reading it, then uh, you might read it again. It's 1 Corinthians 11, where St. Paul says, examine your conscience before you eat, because some of you are eating and falling asleep. Some of you are actually dying. Some of you are eating unto your own condemnation. And St. Paul says you're going to be judged on also the way you receive the body of the Lord. It's a passage that's kind of scary. It's kind of scary. And that would be the, that would be the foundation of one of the conditions to receive the Eucharist. And I think one of the reasons why a lot of people leave the Catholic faith to become Lutherans or born-again Christians or Baptists is that they can go to their ceremonies and whether or not you're living with your, your fifth spouse, you can still come and you can receive the meal of the Lord. Because they have what's called the meal of the Lord. Depend. Most I think about once a month. In which they've got uh, bread, or sometimes crackers, grape juice, or sometimes wine. Depends on the, on, on, on the minister. But that's just consubstantiation or trans, transignification. There's a lot of theological words, but let's get down to brass tight. That's just a symbol. We got the real thing. We got the real thing. So if you go to one of those ceremonies, you're not going to be, so to speak, discriminated against because you can go up and receive that symbol irrespective of your moral state. Whereas if you're a Catholic, you're in mortal sin. You know, you can't receive the Eucharist. Come up, come up for a blessing, but don't come up and receive the Eucharist because you're eating and drinking to your own condemnation. You got it? So that would be the backdrop or the foundation of one of the conditions that we have in receiving the Eucharist. You remember the three conditions is you have to have faith that it's the real presence in the state of grace, and then you have to, you have to fast uh, an hour before. Okay. That is the backdrop of our numbers today. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to jump over 159 and we can end that, end the, the talk right by praying that together and jump into 160. Saint Faustina, who only has a fourth grade education, I think that she'd be a professional poet. I mean, she writes very well, not, not only prose, but also poetry. You know the difference, right? And we'll, we'll see this uh, when we conclude our talk um, by reading, by praying together one of, one of her prayers, which is very, very deep, very mystical, very poetic. So I'm going to start to read 160, and I, I'll probably stop, and I'd like to make a comment on it. You all have your, you have your sheets? Are you there in 160? Yes. Okay. She says, the crusade day, which is the fifth of the month, happened to fall on the first Friday of the month. This was my day for keeping watch before the Lord Jesus. So she's going to make a holy hour or maybe a vigil the whole night. Keeping watch means prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. My, my duty to make an amends to the Lord for all offenses and acts of disrespect and to pray that on this day no sacrilege be committed. Do you see the connection between that and 1 Corinthians? 
Do you? Okay. So I like to do. Uh, I, 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 what I like to do is when I was writing out my talk, I actually wrote out what might be a litany of reparation for the sins against the Eucharist. So I wrote down uh, in front of the Blessed Sack, my holy hour this morning, 10 of the key ways today in which people are offending the Eucharist. That'll be the thrust of my, the, mess, most of my, uh, the rest of my presentation. I've written down 10, but there are many more. Now, the basic thrust of these talks, as well as coming here, is we're here together to persevere and to grow in our prayer life, right? We're not here just to shoot the breeze. We're here to, we want to we wanna go deeper in our spiritual life, right? So this, this presentation is going to, my purpose is to try to enrich another dimension of your prayer, and that's called reparation. And it's one type of prayer that does not come natural to us. I, I said the other day, Thanksgiving for me is a piece of cake. Thanksgiving is so easy because I think it should be for you too, because we have received so much. Thanksgiving should be the easiest, I think. Supplication is not hard. We ask for things, right? Adoration is more difficult, I admit. So with the ACTS, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, supplication, I think the, the TS are very easy. As we, we need many things, we could ask God for help, right? Supplication. Thanksgiving, what do we have that we haven't received? Just our sins, right? God didn't give us our sins. We chose those. But aside from that, uh, aside from that, everything that we have is a gift from God. Everything we have. So we should learn how to, how to thank God, but also we should learn now how to tell God how we're sorry. And Teresa of Avila says, prayer is like talking with a friend. If you have a friend and you want to ask a favor, if you insult your friend and smack your friend in the, smack your friend in the face, right after that, by the way, could you lend me $1,000? It doesn't work that way. First, you have to say, Sorry, I had a bad day. Now, could you give me the $1,000? <laughs> so on a, human, on a human plane, you're not yet, you, before talking with your friend, you have to make amends for the gravity of the fence that you caused by your arrogant and dis disrespectful um, action. Well, God has a heart too. God has feelings. We can hurt God just as much as we can help hurt someone else. And God's heart is much more delicate and sensitive. I'm once hearing a person that said that Jesus and Mary suffered more than us because their nature was much more refined. We tend to be kind of callous, kind of coarse. St. Spanatosco, kind of, you know, kind of obtuse a little bit. <laughs> no offense, no? But Jesus and Mary are very refined, very refined. No? And the more refined the person, the more the person suffers. No? Like someone who knows music is going to suffer much more than a person who has no idea what music is, right? Or a professional painter is going to be more offended by trash than someone who doesn't know anything about painting. Or someone who's a professional writer is probably going to pick up the details more than someone who doesn't, who spells cat, K-A-T-T. -T, okay? So, uh, you know, the more refined the person, the more the person suffers 
at the offense. So God, Jesus and Mary being so refined, suffered all the more with kind of un, the uncouth people that they, that they mixed with. Okay, so let's go through different ways in which the Eucharist is offended and let's uh, formulate our own litany of reparation. I'll give you some ideas, but you might even formulate for yourself your own litany. The first thing I wrote down is just the widespread, vast ignorance ignorance of what the Eucharist is. If you were to ask most Catholics what the Eucharist is, what, what would they say? Do you think most Catholics know what the Eucharist is? So that this is, most Catholics don't even know what the Eucharist is. I would call that a Catholic identity crisis. Like St. James says, someone gets up and looks in the mirror and forgets what he looks like, you know. <laughs> Interesting, no? Catholic identity crisis. And I think the proof is this, of what you all, you all, you all have agreed with me, most Catholics don't know what it is, How often young people will go out and say, Je voy, je voy ir a el pan. I've heard that a lot. Have you heard that, Grace? Yes. How's your Spanish? Malo? Agarrar. Any of you speak Spanish? Not, you forgot your Spanish. Agarrar is translated English to grab. Right? So they, they say, voy a agarrar. I'm going to gra grab the bread. I hate that. We hear it often. Especially m among young people. You know, you got you to polish your Spanish a little bit. <laughs> what should you just see? No, I'm going, I'm, going, I'm going to receive Holy Communion. That's the way you would say it. Spanish, voy a recibir la Santa Comunión if I have to teach you your Spanish, okay? But just that, just that vocabulary is, uh, is an indication that the person doesn't really know what's going on. You know, you, you know, you grab a drumstick from Pollo Loco, right? Or grab your hand if you're sinking in the mud to pull you out, huh? You don't see, you, 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 you grab the Eucharist. That kind of unnerves me. And the part of the problem is that I know language pretty well. And I kind of say, I'm, I'm pretty good at language. I hear that. Ikele. <laughs> Michoka. <laughs> you know, like this with, with your fingers on the board. No? <laughs> Any teachers here? <laughs> And the proof is this, is that how many Catholics go to Mass, how many Catholics in the United States go to Mass every Sunday? Maybe 25%? Mexico, maybe 10%, much less than Mexico here. The, the, the Americans practice much more. How about Rome? Maybe 8%. How about Paris? Well, maybe 7%. Now, Europe has lost its faith, basically. Now, if we go to we go to Poland or, or Nigeria, I think it's a little bit higher. I think in Africa it's pretty, pretty high as a, in comparison. And the proof is this. If I were to um, tell someone, a Catholic outside, maybe just walking down in front of the church, you know, if you meet me tomorrow, at 3 o'clock in the morning, you shake my hand, I'll give you $5 billion. Would you come? 
How about 10 billion? Will you come? At least the baby said yes. <laughs> now that same person said, I tell you, I'll meet you tomorrow at 3 o'clock in the morning to celebrate Mass for you. <laughs> See, the, mo the money, the Eucharist, everyone understands that analogy, huh? But back, back two generations, maybe two, two and a half generations, when um, Eric and Mary and Lupe and Marie, when we were little children, basically everyone went to church. Right, Anne-Marie? Yeah. Yeah, basically, when I was a little kid, I don't remember any of my Catholic friends there in New York. I don't remember any of them ever missing Mass on Sunday because we're afraid to go to hell. Honestly, we had fear of the Lord. <laughs> if we miss, we, we want to go to confession within 24 hours. No, That's two generations ago. Nowadays, people miss Mass like, like who cares? I was talking to Father Larry and the other priests at, at lunch about my talk. And we all agreed that the biggest suffering of Jesus would be, can you tell me the one word, Grace? Nope. One word is this indifference. Father Larry, Father Dave. As soon as I said that, I'll let, yeah. We all agreed. Indifference. You know what that means? Yeah, care. Apathy. Right. The young people, they call it the, the, the whatever generation, whatever. In Espanol, que me importa. Raquel, the whatever generation. Raquel, what do you think the opposite of love is? Hatred? I would say indifference. Can you invite, invite me to uh, your house with Gerard and maybe have a taco or a pizza? And you fight with me. Okay, it kind of hurts. But if you ignore me, you ignore me, that's even more painful. You fight with me, at least you acknowledge my existence as a human person. But you ignore me, you just put me in the garage to entertain your pet parakeet, Pete. I mean, that's much more painful. Why do most marriages fall apart? Because the spouses take each other for granted, right? You've lost your first love. And that's one of the principal reasons why. Those little delicacies that you had maybe when your boyfriend or girlfriend. That's old hat, as we say in New York. It's passe. Huh? It's interesting, when your boyfriend and girl, you can't separate their lips when you get married. No more kisses, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, at least on the anniversary. And you lost your first love. You know, that can happen in a relationship with God. You make the exercise of the 10 week program, you're getting up, you're doing your holy hour, and the time goes on, we start to slip into a state of mediocrity. Almost unaware. So, almost without being aware, but we start to kind of slip into a state of mediocrity. That's why the daily exam is so important. And I've told you more than once, when you do your daily exam, and always kind of check, how did you, how, how'd your holy hour go? Not happy hour, but holy hour, okay? <laughs> and if you see your holy hour is starting to become more, more, more um, anemic or mediocre, hey, you gotta ask yourself why. 
What's happening? What's happening? But I believe this number, this point number one is, if we, if we really believe, because you know, f- f- you know, faith is an intellectual virtue, more than mine. Okay? It's an intellectual virtue, very important. If you are convinced intellectually, you know, you've got a strong, firm conviction that the Eucharist is really God. Maybe I'm a simpleton. How could anyone ever miss Mass if you believe that? Right, Tommy? Uh, am I using logic or am I being illogical? I, Dana? Yeah. If you, if you really believe. I really feel people, I didn't go to Mass on Sunday. Interiorly, I, 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 interiorly, I think, this person doesn't have any faith. $50 million, remember? Because if that host is worth more than the whole universe, how could you, how could you possibly miss Mass if you believe in that? Right, Elvira? But a lot of people don't, because this first point, they really don't believe. Or their faith is very weak. Well, it didn't go because it, well, we had a barbecue and it went out a little bit longer than normal. Yeah, we went to a Dodgers game. It was extra innings and there was traffic on the, on the five. Okay. Well, did you know that there was a Saturday Mass? You know, do you know a little bit about baseball? If you get extra innings, it can be an extra two hours, no? I didn't know that, Father. Well, now you know. Well, you're trying to travel from Sacramento to come to the Mass at 7 o'clock. Well, you know, the freeways in California, sometimes there was traffic, sometimes there's, there's accidents. Go, go, go to Mass Saturday evening. Oh, I never thought about that. Is ever, ever, you go through a day where you, you forget to eat? Oh, no, oh, look, I'm, I'm kind of chubby. No. <laughs> Gordita, no. You, know, you, don't for, you don't forget to eat, but we can forget to eat the body and blood of Christ. We place Russia Pancita and Sema de Dios, huh? Ah, idolatry, huh? So I think we, we have to kind of hammer in our children, our teenagers, Hammer it, I mean, uh, you know, it's really God. Now I tell you, as a teacher and preacher, sometimes I get tired and frustrated. You know? I really do. I, you know, I get tired and frustrated. I mean, I've, you've, you've already heard this 5,000 times. What more do you want? Maybe, I'll, maybe okay, Lord, Please send this person a lightning bolt, okay? <laughs> Thunder and lightning. And send them, you know, into the ER and then I'll visit. Now do you believe in the Eucharist? Oh, yes, Father. Maybe God has to u- utilize some really powerful means and knock, knock us off our horse to believe that that's really God. It's really God. Is this being, being taken for granted? I think it's happened to all of you, at least in your life. You're invited maybe to a party. Maybe you had to go. You know, maybe you got to go. You didn't, really, you didn't really go, but you got to be there. No, no way out of it. <laughs> and you're there, and there's someone in the party that you know, a relative or friend, and he walks right by you. It doesn't even greet you. Grace? Yes. Ever happened? Yes. Uh, That's painful. It happened to all of us. Someone you know, I mean, the, the house isn't really that big, and you're there for two hours, and the person doesn't even greet you. It's painful, right? Yes. Yeah, well, don't we do that to the Lord? Isn't there a real parallel sense we do that to Christ? Does he feel it too? Us. 
I really, I, uh, more and more, I, I, I'm, I'm insistent on the formation of the mind. You know? You're just relying upon emotions. Uh, you're cruising for a bruising, pal. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're in danger, huh? You follow a fluttering emotional heart. God save us. You know? You know, Ignatius, Ignatius gives us a, a, a prayer method, right? I've been preaching the lecture divine about we're not excluding the, the three powers of the soul. Remember what they are? Three powers of the soul would be the, the memory, the intellect, and the will. Now, Ignatius says the will is the most important part. Another name for will would be your heart. That's the most important part, is our heart. But you ever think about it? Why does, why does he start off, number one and two, is memory and intellect? The, the will. The will is here. Memory, intellect, where is it? So our mind has three faculties. Memory, understanding, and imagination. Memory, we call to mind some event. Understand, we try to penetrate the truth that's present there. Imagination, for Ignatius, you try to composition a place, Christ is there with you. And what Ignatius, I think, is saying is not always, I mean, God, God, you can pray and God goes right to your heart. But often the prayer comes first, your memory and your intellect is, is sparked. And then from that you go into the heart. Got that? So you, the memory, you got, you got the topic. Moses before the burning bush. Understanding, okay, you heard me preach this before. I'm Moses. And from that... God is calling you by name. God loves me. I really believe it. The heart. But you had the memory and the understanding before the sparking of the will. So Aquinas says the will is a blind faculty. It's a blind faculty. It has to be directed by an object. It's Aquinas. No? The will is a blind faculty. It has to have some object before it. And that object for us is Jesus, who is the gospel today, and the way, the truth, and the life, right? So I think we have to make a concerted effort to beg the Lord mercy and pardon for just a, 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 weak, a weak catechesis over the past 55 years, right? Some young people, they've only been brought up and raised on, on cotton candy, spiritual cotton candy. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why I, 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 uh, I, 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 really, I really like to, to often to talk to my mother on the phone. Uh, she, she really knows her faith. I, she's not a theologian, doesn't have a degree in theology. But I tell you, wow, this, she's 88 years old. She really knows her faith. And, and my dad passed away just as much as my mom. You know, they, they, they had 12 years of Catholic education, 12 years, from 1940, the 40s and 50s. And that, was the, that was the golden age of American Catholicism. That was the golden age. And, and my mom had the, and Marie, the IHM nuns. Were the, the, those are the best, teach, best teachers in the country. 
Now they have very few vocations. The Immaculate Heart of Mary, at least in, Det in Detroit, they were the best. They were called the, you know, the women Jesuits, basically. And my dad had the Jesuits. Imagine that, both of them having 12 years of Catholic education when it was the best Catholic education in the country. You talk with someone like this, you know, no, matter, no matter what you say in the faith, this person is going to know it much better than us, express it. As I've said, I've been giving over the past couple of weeks, I've been giving talks on the four Marian dogmas and the fifth. And I've been saying over the past couple of weeks, the fifth Marian dogma, you know what that is? Mary is mediatrix of all graces, Mary is co-redemptrix, and Mary is Lupe. Mary is help of Christians. The two people that I know have been promoting this over the past 30 years most is the professor at Steubenville, Franciscan University, Mark Miravalli, who's the, one of the leading Mariologists in the country. And the second one that's been promoting, promoting most is Mrs. Joan Broom. That's my mom, by the way. <laughs> She's been promoting this for the past 30 years. You know, she said, you know, what, what is Our Lady of Nations? And that's an approved Marian apparition. No, none of you have ever heard, ever heard of it before, right? Our Lady, the Mary, Our Lady of All Nations in the 40s, she said, if that is proclaimed as a dogma, the world will, will experience peace. With Korea, with Iran, with Russia, with China, <laughs> We're sitting on a powder keg, right? Just some angry le leader has to get angry at another angry leader, and there are angry leaders, right? The nuclear bomb could fall, and there we are. So I think that, that the proclamation of that dogma is, is important now more than ever. It's Our Lady is Mediatrix of All Graces. Mary as co-redemptrix. And Mary as Lupe? Well, Lady Help a Christian, Don Bosco, right? So if that's proclaimed, Our Lady of All Nations, um, which is it's an approved Marian apparition, none of you ever heard of it, but it's an approved Marian apparition. Have you ever heard of Our Lady of Bano? Approved. How about Bo Ring? Approved. How about Walsingham? Approved. How about uh, Syracuse? Approved. How about Akita? Approved. Th these are approved Mary Napper. I mean, probably most of you only know three. Uh, Lourdes, Fatima, as well as Guadalupe. And those are the three big ones. But these other ones, uh, I think it's not a bad idea to get to know them. Our Lady of Americas. There's one approved in the United States, Our Lady, Our Lady of Good Help, there in Wisconsin, right? That was approved by the bishop. You know, not to say that you have to, but if it's not, if, for example, Bayside, New York, that's been condemned. Garabandal, it's kind of up in the air. Medjugorje, the Pope says people can make pilgrimages there, but still he hasn't given the stamp of approval, right? But if it's an approved Marian apparition, like, for example, you ever hear of Our Lady of La Salette? You see that tabernacle? You know who brought who gave that to us? My mom, 20 years ago. That is a more beautiful tabernacle than the one we have in the church. It's really beautiful. And if you look at it, the whole symbolism is the message of Our Lady of La Salette which was reparation. You ever read Our Lady of La Salette? It's one of the most fascinating apparitions. Our Lady of La Salette, she's sitting in the middle of a pond. And you know what she's doing? This is this Our, Lady, Our Lady of La Salette. She's sitting down and she's weeping. 
You don't believe me, do you? Check it, check it out. Check it out. She's sitting, she's sitting, she's sitting, and she's weeping. This is in, uh, this is in the, time, the time of the Curie of Ars, like 1840, 18, 18, almost the same time of um, Ruta Bach also. Very close to the time of Our Lady of Lourdes, actually. Now talking about, okay, talking about reparation, she wept because of three sins. What do you think they were, John? You're an expert in Marian apparitions, right? Okay, I'll tell you. One would be blasphemy. You've heard of blasphemy, right? Blasphemy, you're not cursing God. That, that, that was really common in, in, that, in that town. People, people were, were, were cursing God. That's serious. That's against the first commandment. What else? They were eating meat on Friday. Back then, it was a, it was a universal norm that no meat on Friday, they could care less. And the third related to this topic, Juanita? Yeah, they did, people were not going to Mass on Sunday. So because of those three sins, Our Lady was weeping profuse tears. So you see a, a hammer in pin says, in which Our Lady is asking us to unfasten the nail. Unfasten the nail. Fast on Jesus who's suffering on the cross. Those sins are responsible for Jesus suffering on the cross. And the two children were Melanie and, Ma and Maximum. This is La Salette. And it was reparation. And that's the topic today, reparation for the sins against the Eucharist. So my basic thrust, I think, on the first point is many, many sins are committed because of ignorance. Many, many sins are committed because of ignorance. And I experience on the whole, there's just a, a, a lot of a lot of intellectual laziness, almost across the board. Especially among Catholics. Just a, just a vast, widespread intellectual laziness. Why is it that you have so many teenagers that are turned off, turned off to God? Why? Well, I, 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 we, we battle with this because, but I, you can't give what you don't have. If the parents are not on fire with the love of God, they really love God, they're on fire with the love of God, they're living their faith, their kids are going to have some of that fire. Well, the parents are, they're deadbeats, they don't really know their faith, they don't practice their faith, they don't care about their faith, Maybe they go to Mass sometimes. They never receive Holy Communion. How on earth are their kids going to have faith living in a paganistic world? <coughs> I mentioned this maybe about six months ago when I celebrated my 25th anniversary. In a week it'll be, in, in eight days it'll be... Uh, eight years ago, I had some of my relatives come to visit me. My mom, my dad, one of my brothers, three or four of my siblings. My parents have 39 grandchildren, pretty, pretty big family, huh? And one of the ladies who works in the church, 
she said that really what, what impressed me most about my mother was what happened after she received Holy Communion. And that she knelt down, there was a thousand people there for the Mass, knelt down totally oblivious to all the people there, and, and she just knelt down, closed her eyes, covered her eyes, for about 10 minutes was in silent prayer. And the, the worker here was kind of blown away. Wow, that, that, that lady's got faith. Maybe that's the reason why she got a son who was a priest. That's me, huh? You know, I, I, picked, up, uh, I picked up those, those vibes when I was a kid. And so much to say it, but you know, you can, you can tell. You can tell when you're living with a person that's got deep faith, right? You don't have to say that. Just, just by doing that, that's worth more than a million words. No? It happened with most people. After, after two minutes, Ninety-nine percent of the people, right? Yeah. And that's an indication that they don't really have faith. Right. Have you ever come to my masses? Not yet. What do I do after? What do I do after communion? What do I do today, Elvira and Mary? Five minutes, right? Five minutes. Oh, poor Rosita, Father Broom fell asleep. Yeah. What am I doing? I'm talking to God. I'm talking to God. Those are the most important minutes of the day, the most important minutes of the week, is when you have received Holy Communion and you're talking to God. You believe it? Yes. You're talking to God. I do it for a second reason. I do it for myself, and I try to do it to try to give you good example. Yeah? We're called to give good example, right? Not to say Father Broom is falling asleep. Well, well maybe, maybe, he's, maybe he's talking to Jesus. Oh, maybe I should do the same thing. Oh. And I'm not, I'm not patronizing or disparaging your intelligence. If you use your conclusion, maybe he's not, maybe he's not tired. Maybe he's just in deep dialogue with the Eucharistic Lord. Ah, maybe I should do that too. I'll try to follow the example of, of that priest. They say in Spanish, El ejemplo arrastra. El ejemplo arrastra, you ever hear that one? Example pulls. No? El ejemplo arrastra. So um, I'd like to leave you with three questions. Can I? Yes. Can I? Yes. Okay. How can okay? How can you strengthen your knowledge of the Eucharist? That's the first question. I'm going to leave you, and you can pray over that, and maybe try to implement that this week. How can you? How can you grow stronger in your faith in the Eucharist? We're talking not only intellectually. Second is this. How, how, can, you, how can you transmit this to others? Because we're called to be missionaries. Listen to the Acts of the Apostles. We're in the missionary document now. Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Mark. If you got it for yourself, how can you present this to others? And the third is this. What person, okay, what, okay, what individual person in your life right now 
maybe a son or a daughter, someone, do you think you can maybe talk to about the Eucharist? I think every one of you have some one person in the world in mind. Not if you pray and think the Holy Spirit's going to enlighten you. Hey, we're living in a city with millions of people, no? And I think if you pray over that, the Holy Spirit, ah, at work there's, there's a Catholic that was asking me a question about something. Ah, okay, that's the person I can maybe talk to that person about the Mass and the Eucharist. I can give them a pamphlet. I can give them maybe, maybe a reference to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I can maybe give them a, a card, a miracle of Lanciano, whatever. Be creative. These are souls to be saved. And if Catholics love the Eucharist, they will be saved. Because Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, and blessed the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. So together we're going to close by praying together. Number 159, this is a beautiful prayer of St. Faustina, manifesting her great love for the Eucharist. Are you ready? Together. O blessed host, in gold and chalice enclosed for me, that through the vast wilderness of exile I may pass pure, immaculate, undefiled. O grant that through the power of your love this might come to be. O blessed host, Take up your dwelling within my soul, O thou in my heart's purest love, with your brilliance the darkness dispel. Fuse not your grace to a humble heart, O blessed host, enchantment of all heaven. Though your beauty be veiled and captured in a crumb of bread, strong faith tears away that veil. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. So God bless you all. Thank you.